So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our ISP presentations. I want to welcome our presenters, students, faculty members, and any friends and family who may be in the audience. First, I want to commend our participating students for the hard work that they've put in all year long. So let's give them a round of applause. And our ISP program is special because it affords students the opportunity to do a deep dive into an area of particular interest and receive credit for their research and work. The ISP program connects to our mission to foster critical and creative thinking, build strong communication skills, and encourage lifetime learning. Socrates said, education is a kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. Our students who participate in the ISP program drive their own project, sparked by their personal intellectual interests, with guidance and support from faculty sponsors. Our students are actively seeking knowledge and understanding with the intrinsic motivation of their own curiosity as their guiding light. Following each of our student presentations, there will be a brief question and answer session. I invite you to join us for refreshments in the lobby at the conclusion of our presentations today. So first I'd like to welcome up Gabe Sanchez, who's going to talk to us about his ISP on philosophy. Start letting me talk. Yeah. I'm not going to stop. So, <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much, Ms. Brady, for that introduction. Um, although I have to say that you mentioned Socrates, ironically, Socrates is one of the kind of rival schools of philosophy, the ones I've been studying. <laughs> so that's kind of very true. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm supposed to talk about philosophy, but now that I'm thinking about it, I kind of want to just start a comedy act. So you don't mind. <laughs> so, um, I've been working with Mr. Garland on my philosophy project since last August. Um, the original title was The Value of Human Existence. It's a very dramatic name. I didn't know what it really mean at the time. Um, we started when we started meeting, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something in philosophy, so we kind of got together, thought of a bunch of problems like the problem of evil, free will, determinism, things like that, and I kind of realized that. Um, I wanted to do something broad that would allow me to explore many different areas, so I thought of doing something of living itself. <laughs> so after I decided on the topic, um, we came up with a list of works that I would go into. And I picked four of them, which I won't talk about today. And I started off with existentialism and existentialist writers from the 19th and 20th centuries. And then after I was done with those, I kind of moved to Stoicism in ancient Greece and Rome, which they're very different, but essentially they are present in the similar problems. So, the first book we read um, was Kierkegaard's Either Or, and in this book by this uh, 19th century philosopher, he crafts two characters that debate each other on the, the question of what is a good life. Um, and one of them is arguing for the hedonist perspective of life. He, He's called a seducer, and he's making his argument for pleasure. Um, the other character in the show, in the, sorry, in the book, is making his argument for the ethical lifestyle, the more uh, Britannical um, approach to life. But um, at the end of the day, you know, what I learned from Kierkegaard is the power of choice and authenticity, and the value that decisions themselves have. So that's why I have chosen this quote. My either or does not, in the first instance, you know the choice between good and evil, it you knows the choice whereby one chooses good and evil or excludes them. Here the question is what determines one would contemplate the whole of existence, how would himself live? It is therefore not so much a question of choosing between will and the good or the evil as of choosing to will. So this is something, this, this is an idea that really influenced my writing and my thinking later in the second semester, this idea of like choice and authenticity and the power of the decisions. So after I was done with Kierkegaard, I moved to 20th century philosophy. I read um, Albert Camus, and I think that my French teacher cringed somewhere right now. <laughs> uh, the Myth of Sisyphus. And I have to say that it's probably out of all the books that I read, my favorite one out of all of them. Just not that I agree with all of everything he had to say, but the language in this book was so rich and so, it was really good. It makes me cringe every time I think about it. It's, I could taste it. Um, and I don't want to go a lot into Mythos Sisyphus because, again, if I start talking, I won't stop. 
but he's basically addressing what he calls the idea of philosophical suicide. And uh, he makes the argument that the only real problem in philosophy is how to make your life worth living, and that everything else comes afterwards. And this is a really bold well statement to make, and it kind of really impacted me in the way that I thought of philosophy and why am I doing all this. Um, and then, kind of spoiler alert, he ends up saying that, yeah, life is pretty much worth living, and it's, it's a wonderful life, which is a movie I also saw from my independent study. Great movie, by the way. And he ends with this quote, which I really, really like. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine it's as if it's happy. So he starts by asking this question, and then he kind of goes to the answer, explores all the implications of that answer, and set up with this very optimistic view, like that even if everything seems really absurd, life is still very much worth living, and there are a lot of great things in it to still do. So, I don't know if anyone has read Existentialist Writers, but it can be a lot of work. <laughs> so after I was done with these two writers, I moved on to more um, lighter stuff. I moved on to Stoicism, and I read a lot of ancient and modern Stoicism. Um, I read um, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, and a lot of articles on modern Stoicism after that. So I started with uh, the Meditations. Um, the Meditations are just um, basically a collection of quotes by a Roman emperor who was also a philosopher. And what's really interesting about it is it's uh, his own private dormant. It's not a, you know, a philosophical thesis or anything. It's interesting because it's a conversation between the reader and the writer until you realize that they are his own private journal. So it's more of a conversation between the writer and himself, which made it really human because he talks about how to improve as a person, how to improve his relationships, his civic duties as a Roman emperor, but also how to overcome things like his fear of his own mortality, which is something that we don't know what you should think about, especially coming from a Roman emperor. Um, but I really like his approach, and approach he talked about many of the similar issues of the existentialists, but in a very different manner. And he talked a lot about virtue and reason and control and things like that, which later eventually influenced my writing quite a lot too. And he himself was influenced by Epictetus and the end Curidium, Curidium, something like that. Translates to man. And he said pretty much the same thing. So he focused a little more on the idea of freedom. Um, he himself was a slave for most of his lifetime, and I think he had a physical disability as well later. So he, he saw reason and our virtues and our moral character as a way to escape that lack of control that we have over the world. He thought that the way to be happy was to use those to gain control over our own emotions and our own lives. So um, after that, um, th that's the last book that I read, um, and after that I had to start writing something <laughs> for this presentation. And I was really inspired by Epictetus' manual, and I thought of coming up with my own manual. You know, a pocketbook that I could bring off to college, into the real world, to kind of define what it means to be gay, to what it means to be happy for this system of personal ethics. Um, and that's what I started working on for the second semester. I've been writing essays and essays and essays. Everything from real academic essays and happiness to short stories, um, some comedy as well, um, many different things. And then what I start talking about now. So the first thing I did, I set up some basic rules for myself as a system of codes. And I have my Ten Commandments of sorts. They talk about integrity, um, authenticity. Um, I have one about art as well, even. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them because. Again, if I start talking, I'll never stop. Um, I'm gonna, for the most important ones are the first one and the last one. Um, the first one, which you have up there, is the purpose of philosophy is to live a happy and meaningful life. And to me, that's the most important one of all my rules. It's kind of the epitome of everything I have read up to this moment. The thing that bridged all the philosophers that I had explored was this idea of life and how to live a good life and make it meaningful and make it happy. And that's kind of path I made with myself that everything I was about to write, everything I was about to think, had this motivation behind it, how to be the best human being that I can be. And that influenced all of the other rules, all of 
my other essays, like trying to answer that question. Uh, yeah, more rules here about choices, integrity, freedom, all that. Um, and finally, we get to the last one, uh, number 10. And I, this talks about the idea of life itself, birth and death, and being aware of your mortality and the passage of time, and how scary that can be at times. And the existentialists were obsessed with this idea. And so were the Stoics, really, actually. Um, my thoughts were more influenced by what Marcus Aurelius had to say about it. Because he was, I would argue, he was very much afraid of his own mortality. Yet he found a way to deal with it, and he realized that this didn't take meaning away from his life, but quite the opposite, actually gave him more meaning. It allowed him to be the best person he could be today, in the present moment. Mindfulness is something that he practiced a lot, actually. Uh, so once this were set up, um, I started to think about many different topics. Um, this is what, um, I, well, my first one technically was my fine X essay. It was my U Chicago essay. It's got me to college, so <laughs> that was exciting times. Um, and it was very much inspired by the myth of Sisyphus and this idea of the absurdity. Um, how sometimes it seems like it's really silly to try to find meaning where there is none. So the prompt that I had from U Chicago was this fine X, and I kind of approached that similar idea that. Whenever you try to find x, you find it, and then there's another quadratic equation that you have to solve, and then you find another value of x, and then you try again, and again, and again, and then you eventually, I have solved like billions of equations in the past 10 years, and x keeps changing and changing and changing, so I kind of make this analogy that it's kind of absurd to try to find x, and it's really, it's pretty much impossible, but then I go on and on and on, and I come up with three solutions to plot to this condition that you can then add the question, you know, throw away the test, get out of the room, leave, fail, everything. You could claim an arbitrary answer, something like 42, something like that. Or you can find enjoyment in searching for X itself, which is something that um, Sisyphus did in a community argument in this essay, that your moral character is defined by consistency, your struggle to survive and to keep fighting, even though it seems absurd, and if finding happiness in the process itself. Okay, I'm coming to college, so yay. Then this semester, the, this isn't the first one that I wrote technically, but this is my fundamental essay in which I outline my philosophy of human nature and happiness. I kind of look at human nature in three dimensions, so I talked about the self the rational part of it, yeah, that human beings are free, they have freedom to be good people, they have moral um, capabilities, rational approach and responsibilities to themselves to improve as people. And this is a pulpit for my essay actually, um, that, about that first aspect of it, the value of the self and money. And after that I move on to, okay, well, and that's something that was very much influenced actually by Aristotle and his theories on happiness and the Stoics and his theories on virtue. And my second part of this essay kind of diverged from the Stoics a lot. Because the Stoics were not very much into the idea of attachment and love and social relationships. They were very social people, but they saw it in kind of ethical duties more than actual authentic relationships. And my thinking kind of diverges a lot from that here, and I kind of see it as, you know, that um, it is in our nature to be social animals, to love each other and to form those authentic relationships, even if that leads to attachment, to grief, and all those negative feelings and impact that can have on the self. And there's a lot of value in those relationships that kind of outweighs everything else. To an extent, of course. And that's going to talk about social virtues and compassion and care as virtues that are necessary as well for the human uh, being to be happy. And then I kind of move on to, uh, I take the personal and social, and I talked about this idea of citizenship and cosmopolitanism. And this idea of considering humanity as the end of our, all of our actions. Um, yeah, and there, this is kind of the foundational outline of my philosophies, and then I use those ideas and I apply it to different problems, which is why the next essays will 
clean. The first one, actually, it simulates. <laughs> uh, it was a very, uh, it's a very real problem in the world today, I have, I would say. And I kind of looked at it as an existential crisis, actually. You know, so, uh, the symptoms of simulators are apathy, not caring about anything, thinking that it doesn't matter what you do, there are no consequences to your actions. Um, you know, I get simulators too. It was very real. And I kind of looked at it, well, that sounds a lot like an existential crisis, this nihilist approach to life. And then it's like, okay, well, you could, how do you solve this crisis? Well, you take the hedonist approach, and you know, partying weekdays. Um, you could not really realize that the senior year is about to end and not care about it. Or you kind of take the middle of ground. And you try to be a good senior, you try to make your time count. Revolt against the fact that grades don't really matter anymore. Right? Keep working just for the sake of it, for your own integrity. You try to establish those authentic relationships, even if you're about to leave and probably never see your friends again. There's a lot of value in the present moment, even if graduation means it's all kind of soon. So um, after that, I moved on to, well, this is specifically I looked at. So there's this part in the meditations that talks about waking up in the morning and the different ways that you can wake up in the morning. And I really like that section of meditation, so I wrote my own on how to wake up in the morning essay. And the first type of waking up is when you wake up, uh, waking up by your alarm. You have to go to class, and you really don't want to. Um, so I kind of go through the uh, trends of thought of someone that's waking up in the morning because of the, so the alarm, how to master that you know, lack of control that you have over that how to own up to your responsibilities to be a human being, go do your things in the morning. Um, then I look at, well, what if you wake up in the middle of a nightmare? And you're really afraid because you think that your dreams are literally killing you or something like that. I kind of took this approach in a metaphysical sense, like what is real, what is not. And again, I go back to this idea of the present moment. Today is today and that is what's real. And I'm in control of that and I can make it that. The third one is kind of uh, really similar to the other two. Like, what if you don't have to wake up in the morning and you don't want to? Well, you can do great things today, even if you don't really have the will to do it. <laughs> um, then um, I was focused on high school, and then I thought, okay, I'm gonna I probably want to use this book in college. So I kind of talked about this idea of absolute freedom. And when I go to college, I'm going to my parents, I'm going to have the freedom to show up to class whenever I want to, whatever I want really. And so I crafted this character and I sent him off to Brown University, where his actions have any consequences, he doesn't have to study for his classes or whatever, and how to navigate that freedom. And again, he first goes to the hedonist approach, and then he goes to the ethical approach, and then kind of hangs himself in the middle. Happy me, that aspect of moderation. Uh, this is another pull quote from it. Kind of argued that the value of these decisions, even if they have no consequences, is going to come from his willpower, from his integrity. And that's kind of what really matters. So, okay. Okay. so um, another aspect that I used to love about college, well, it's really scary to go out into the real world. So I adapted this monster, I call him the unknown. And I wrote this really dramatic and poetic essay about how to tame and slay the unknown. And I kind of conclude with the, the idea that, you know, even if it's really scary, it's something that will make you grow. It's part of life. It's not a negative thing. It's not quite the opposite. It's something you have to accept. It's something that you have to tame and make it your own. And then it will become an adventure, not really something to be afraid of. And then, okay, so after college, I'll uh, probably want to have a family at some point, so I wrote an essay on parent, how to be a good dad. And remember my dad, I'm very, very comedic. I have lots of different dad jokes in it. Uh, mixed in with philosophy on the ethics of being a dad. Um, this one's a really simple one, just if you want to be a good dad, just care for your kid. <laughs> and I just say that over and over again with many different fancy words and <laughs> 
then I moved on, okay, to the more abstract sphere. Um, I talked about literature and how fun. This is, a, this is a fun one, actually, because I was having an argument, well, argument, discussion with one of my friends, um, some of my friends, Sue and Kyle, about whether literature needed hope or not, if you needed to be optimistic or not. And they said, yeah, it has to. And they were like, no, it doesn't have to. So I went home that day and I wrote this 2,000 word essay about why it does. <laughs> and I went um, to Ms. Lawrence's class the next morning and I saw TJ there and I slapped him with a cloak and I slammed my essay on his desk and I challenged him to a literary, if you will. <laughs> it was really fun. He hasn't answered me yet, I have to say. So I do see him, remind him. Um, but basically, I make this argument for hope, why hope is essential in life, even in literature. Then I moved on to the more civic sphere um, on justice. And this specific essay was inspired by Cicero's in defense of injustice, in which he crafts this character that makes an argument in favor of injustice, and that kind of proves why justice is needed in life. So I kind of take the same approach, and I crafted these three different characters. One of them is the accused, who makes the argument in favor of injustice. That's him speaking right now. He says that, well, Justice keeps changing with you know, time, cultural settings, so what is the actual justice that everyone's trying to achieve? And he makes his argument, well, it's not really real, so I should only care for myself. And then comes the chair of the council that's trying to be accused and makes this totalitarian argument as to why the state embodies the social contract and is needed to preserve society, because without the state, it couldn't. So it should do whatever it needs to do to preserve civilization. Then there's a philosopher observing all this, and he says, well, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right. And he makes his argument for why it's about balance between freedom and safety, and you know, always thinking of human dignity first, and that's the most important thing when it comes to justice. Um, finally, <laughs> my last essay, um, it's a short story actually, Mr. Garland suggested that I should write something um, you know, for creative sphere. And uh, I was really, this was a really bittersweet moment for me because it was my last essay of the year. Um, I didn't really outline any philosophies necessarily, but rather kind of um, make, make all my philosophies into a physical, visual concept. Uh, so the story is told from the perspective of an old man remembering a childhood moment of this and how he interacts with this character that I call the gentleman. And how this gentleman kind of it's a story about childhood and the things that we lose when we grow up. Uh, I'm going to turn 18 in four days. Uh, again, this idea of the ex existential angst and everything that's associated with growing up kind of can be really scary and then But, um, you know, the child kind of learns some things from the gentleman and how you don't have to lose all those things when you grow up. There are things that matter, that are essential, and that so like the genuine one didn't lose his values, so something I didn't necessarily need to lose myself. Um, so that's kind of the end of it, um, of everything that I've done. Um, before I, and I want to, yesterday, when I was looking over my notes, I found the first essay that I turned into Mr. Garland this semester. And on the back of it, I hadn't seen this, but I saw this last night, there was a quote, and I, I thought it was really funny, because I hadn't seen it before. And I really liked it, so I'm going to read it out loud to you. I knew that what I was seeking to discover was a thing I'd always known, that all courage was a form of constancy, that it was always himself that the coward abandoned first. After this, a lot of betrayals come into me. And that's from All the Pretty Horses by Corn McCarthy. So, thank you for your time. No? <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start. I'm, I'm curious about how you decided on the structure of your personal philosophy. So I love the way that you, you set it up. Um, what inspired you to structure it that way? Um, you know, was it your reading? Was it, can you talk about that process? Yes, um, my, the, re the readings that I, all the reading that I did, which is a lot, um, inspired a lot. Um, you know, the Stoics and their approach to reason and virtue something I always kept in mind, uh, the existentialism, their approach to the absurdity, something I always kept in mind. Uh, 
something that I was for me was really important was to, like I said, the, what is the purpose of philosophy? Well, it's happiness. It's the improvement of the self, the improvement of your relationships, of society itself. So I kind of always looked at it in terms of different spheres right. and how it is affected by your decision making, by your own ethical beliefs, and all those kind of things. So very much inspired by it. Okay, I really enjoyed that. Um, reading philosophy, as you indicated, can be somewhat difficult in the first times. What about writing? Philosophy. Tell me about how this kind of changed the way you work as a writer. Wow. Um, it is. I, I would argue that um, I've developed a lot of voice in my writing. Um, my writing philosophy is um, uh, it's something that it kind of forces you to think about really different things and kind of arrive at a conclusion. Um, you know, the way I usually make my arguments is that okay, I set some definitions. Maybe in human nature, maybe criteria of what is a good dad, and then kind of examining how to get there, what are the implications of those definitions. It's a very logical approach, which actually it's um, kind of inspired by some of the things we learned in math class, linear algebra, that you have definitions and all the implications of definitions have and proofs and everything. Um, but something I noticed as well is that a lot of times I don't know where I want to go with my essay until I get there as well and writing kind of helps a lot in the thinking process. Uh, for example, in my ethics of senior writers, at first I was like, I'm freaking out, I'm a senior, I don't want to be a senior. And I was writing the essay and when I got to the end, I ended up smiling a lot and I was very happy to arrive at a conclusion that even if I was a senior, there was a lot of value in that. that I Thank you so much. Great. Next, we have Anton, and he's going to talk to us about developing Android applications. Is that correct? So, oh. I've been fascinated with computers ever since sophomore year. I decided to take computer sciences one and two. While the class didn't cover very much about programming itself, it started a baseline for my understanding of computers and how they work. And this led to me to wanting to take AP Computer Science my junior year. And that was a class entirely dedicated to programming, so I was thrilled. And it also presented an opportunity for me, because we took a trip to the Houston Code Wars, and that was a very unique experience because it took what all we learned in the classroom and presented it in such a way as problem solving, which is much what computer science is in real life. It is building stuff to solve everyday problems. And so that is what I used as my segue into my independent study program. I took what I learned in AP Computer Science and pushed it further. Instead of developing applications for computers, such as we did in AP Computer Science my junior year, I decided to push that and go into Android. So starting off, I had to select a textbook to use. And while there are plenty of resources available for programming, I just couldn't find the right one. So I communicated with my cousin, who works for an application development company in Russia. And he, select, and he selected the C-sharp 6.0 in a nutshell book, which I thought, okay, that sounds fine, sure. But what I didn't expect is to be reading a literal brick for my first semester. So a lot of my time was dedicated to going through these 2,000 or so pages and learning about the C-sharp language. And unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Because while the book does cover a lot of C-sharp syntax, it doesn't go into exactly what I needed for my uh, program. So I had to combine it with my previous AP computer science textbook. That was a lot of reading. <laughs> so I did the research. I learned uh, C sharp language. But what do I do with it? Programming is about problem solving, so I had to find a problem. Every time a teacher says, all right, class, let's split off into groups, 
the groups are never balanced. Sometimes, if the teacher lets the groups be picked by themselves, the students will pair off with their friends and productivity goes down. And if a teacher decides to just randomly number off students to say, all oh, right, that's one group, that's another group, that's a lot of time wasted and isn't very useful either because sometimes the teacher's just like, all right, those four are a group, those four are a group, and still, and again, people are with their friends, productivity goes down. So I uh, decided to make a program that can combat that. I made a team generator, and I used the Xamarin Integrated Development Environment, which is basically a fancy word for a program that helps you build programs. It is a subset of Microsoft's Visual Studio, and is designed specifically for uh, phone application development. And since it's by the creators of Visual Studio, there's plenty of online resources to help me get along with it. And I got my semester one result done. I made an app that can generate teams. But a problem that I ran into while doing this is I had to manually type in every single name for every single student every time I wanted to generate a new team. So I looked into how to access long-term storage on the phone, how to make it so when I clicked save team, the team would actually be saved and remembered no matter how many times the phone was restarted. This combated the issue of time efficiency versus a teacher selecting teams. And I think, in my opinion, it was more efficient. I uh, made it so that the user has to input number of people per team, number of teams, and the names of the students. But I'm sure, as most of you know, if you have 18 students, you cannot have teams of five. So I made it so the phone can only offer you teams that are available with the number of people you have. So if you do have 18 students, the phone will only offer to make teams of 2, 3, 6, or 9. So I made the app. I used Xamarin, and it was working. How do I get it on my phone? <laughs> that was an issue that I struggled with greatly. Because to get an app onto, uh, onto a phone, you need many more additional resources. And you have to I had to like make my phone into a special debugging mode so I could actually access like its internal code to be able to add apps not through a Play Store. And that was certainly an experience, and now my computer is full of random programs that I'm probably never going to use again that I had to use once just to transfer the files over. But it works, and that's what matters. So off of reading books and uh, all the other stuff I had to do for semester one as a senior, I was able to move forward uh, into my semester two. And while semester one, I just my goal was just to make a simple app that could make teams. That's it. So for my second semester, I decided to push that and go into something a bit more fun. Because what do people use their phones for other than games? So I made a game. Um, the, the popular game Simon is a circle with four colors on it, and the colors light up in increasing difficulty, and the goal of the player is to remember the orders in which the colors lit up and be able to press them while the colors keep adding on and on and on. And I found that the studio I was using originally, Xamarin, was not capable of doing that. It did not have the capabilities for game development that I needed to make this. So I switched over to Unity, which is a very popular uh, game development studio that many indie companies use. And it has the capabilities of making applications for Android as well. So that was a bonus. The first problem I ran into was I had to relearn how to use Unity. Because spending my first semester using Xamarin, none of that carried over into Unity. Except for some of the slight nuances about how the phone layout works and how there's a, an external like sublayer that the user has access to called the user interface, which is the part that you click on the phone, and how that connects with the internal code that actually makes the buttons do what you want them to do. That was the only similarity. Other than that, Unity was completely different. But I was able to work through it. Because since Unity is so popular as an indie development studio, there were plenty of online resources available to help me learn. And my Simon game works. 
Instead of four buttons, I use six. And every time a user presses it, a little sound plays if they press it correctly, and the numbers keep adding on and on and on, and the game keeps getting longer and longer. And using what I learned in the first semester with my accessing long-term storage to save list of students, I made it so that my Simon game can save a high score. And so no matter how many times you restart the program or restart your phone, it will always have a high score saved that you can try and beat next time. And with that, I concluded my independent study. I made what I promised I'd make. I made it a game and I made a useful application. I read through 3,000 something pages of textbook <laughs> and I read through forums, YouTube tutorials and everything else that I had access to. And it works. Thank you. Okay, so that was phenomenal. Um, you know, it's wonderful that you took a problem that you encountered in class, or that, and I wish I would have mentioned it when I started teaching uh, with that app. Do you see additional applications for your team generator outside of the uh, event the second? Um, yes. Uh, during our school's land party, we had a tournament, and we needed to be able to generate teams fast, and I was like, I made an app, let's use that. <laughs> And what did you find in terms of the response from the teams that were formed? Did, uh, did it go well? Yeah. All the teams were balanced. There were no team that was like made uh, un unfairly powerful by the application. It was completely random. Yes? Uh, there were several times when you talked about a problem you had and how you just kind of figured it out. I was wondering what that looks like for you when you come across a problem and computer science and coding, whatever it may be, um, how do you figure it out when you're, when you're stuck? How do you get unstuck? Spending two to four hours on Google searching up what the problem is and how other people have solved it, watching YouTube tutorials, browsing through forums. Uh, there's plenty of like uh, resources available online for developers, so I was just able to find the right ones. Great. Where are you, you going to go from here? I'm actually not entirely sure. I'll probably like show this to my cousin who helped me get started and see if he has any input as to what I can do from here, how I can go. Um, yeah, I haven't really had any plans for it. It's just kind of a, an extension of last year's AP Computer Science class that I turned into my own thing. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm TJ Gill. Let me just get myself configured and everything. Okay. <clears throat> good morning. Um, as I said, my name is TJ Gill and I did my project on happiness with Dr. Estrada. So I first became interested in this idea of happiness two summers ago as my dad was unpacking our suitcase um, coming back from a trip to Australia and he pulled out this book, The Art of Happiness by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, but I'm not going to talk about Buddhism or the intangible idea of spiritual enlightenment that takes up a good portion of that book. I'm talking about the idea of happiness. Throughout the book, the Dalai Lama engages with a psychologist and they try to find the overlap between the idea of spiritual enlightenment and the tangible idea of happiness that we talk about in psychology and other fields of science. The Dalai Lama even said, if scientific analysis were conclusively to demonstrate certain claims of Buddhism to be false, then we must accept the findings of science and abandon those claims. So it was more with a scientific aim that I approached this project. Last summer, this interest in happiness took me to India, where I volunteered at a small monastery for young monks. Um, there I taught them fundamental English and math skills, and in turn, um, I wanted to gain insights into their simpler lives, the value of simplicity, and what I could possibly gain from that. Um, this enabled me to see the importance of being focused on certain things and to be more aware of those things that um, consumed my time, those things that distracted me. And it even influenced me to such a far extent that upon coming back to the US, I got rid of social media for six months. Unfortunately, I'm back on it though. <laughs>
but the project itself. So as I talked about, it was understanding the nature of happiness and the factors which contribute to it. Happiness or well-being, as we saw as being synonymous throughout the study, is a combination of long-term satisfaction as well as daily levels of joy. But how much do we actually control? In one of the studies I read, The Psychology of Happiness, research has found that happiness is determined by three key factors. Our set point um, determines about 50%, and that's determined genetically and by biological factors, what we're born with. That's why it's called the set point. 10% um, of it is then determined by circumstances, marital status, economic um, circumstances, as well as other things. But the main point that I want to highlight is that 40% of our happiness is actually controlled by the things we do on a daily basis. This was kind of the first major realization that I made in this study. Moving on though, in a more philosophical sense, um, another piece that I read called The Brain of Buddha, it kind of outlines the three fundamentals of well-being or happiness, um, and they are virtue, wisdom, and mindfulness. Virtue kind of highlights the regulation of our behavior and our thoughts, as well as our actions, kind of emphasizing the things that make us feel good, those positive things, and kind of um, ensuring that we minimize those things that um, may result in negative thoughts or negative behaviors. Wisdom entails the idea of learning from our past mistakes and applying that to the future. And then finally, mindfulness involves the skillful use of both attention to both your inner and outer world, worlds. And it involves an awareness that arises from focusing on the present moment. But in addition to that, focusing in a non-judgmental sense. That's something that I very much want to emphasize. And so, all of these studies and all of this research kind of uh, motivated me to do something at Cooper, to kind of implement specifically mindfulness in the Cooper community to make students' lives less stressful and more enjoyable. So looking at this data that Dr. Estrada acquired actually in the first semester when he surveyed the entirety of the upper school, you can see that there are a multitude of stresses that plague the lives of the average John Cooper student, the vast majority coming from academics, but also those from extracurricular activities, social life, um, home life, and naturally these stresses are one of the main factors that contribute to the average, uh, to the overall unhappiness or discontent um, that the average John Cooper student or average student may have. And so with the project we kind of wanted to deal with these issues and we kind of wanted to see how could we make lives more enjoyable, how could we minimize these stresses to some extent. But um, the power of now, I want to talk about that first. This was one of the um, pieces that I came across in my study that actually a friend recommended to me. And essentially it's a philosophical guidebook to achieving well-being or a sense of contentment. In it, the author Eckhart Tolle discusses the importance of focusing on the moment, as you could have gleaned from the title. And he opens the book by stating that nothing he ever did could possibly add to what he ever had. In this sense, it's all about focusing on the present moment, not immersing yourself into those worries associated with the past or those anxieties about the future, but focusing on what you have now. And this very much relates to the idea of mindfulness that we aim to implement in the Cooper community because it, it entails the idea of creating space between your thoughts and your actions and ultimately um, your behaviors and your life. Um, although totally highlights a philosophical approach to a state of well-being, he doesn't really um, highlight practical methods to achieve it. And this was something, as I talked about earlier, that Dr. Estrada and I really wanted to achieve. We wanted to offer um, a certain methodology to students that they could implement in their lives to help them deal with the stresses that I highlighted earlier. So, talking about mindfulness. Um, ultimately, as I talked about earlier, the idea of mindfulness as a term translates to the idea of being immersed in the present moment, but being aware in a non-judgmental fashion. Mindfulness meditation usually requires the individual to sit in an upright position, to focus on his or her breath, and not to eradicate the idea of thoughts, but simply to let thoughts come and go and to let them dissipate, but don't fully immerse yourself into them. Um, this mindfulness meditation practice was practiced for about one to two minutes in Ms. Wiggins um, G period class and we wanted to see the effects of it with, um, by surveying the students. 
before um, the practice, we surveyed them, asking them what their perception of mindfulness was up to that point, what they thought about it, if they'd ever engaged in the practice beforehand. Um, most of the responses went along the lines of, I had no real idea what mindfulness was, some thought it was simply nap time. <laughs> but after um, a few months of them being engaged in the practice, um, the responses went more along the lines of, yes, I think it has lower stress levels, I think there is a difference, however, we do not do it long enough for it to have a practical purpose. And I'll kind of address that um, in the moving forward section at the end of the presentation. But ultimately, for the most part, the students did enjoy the practice, and when Ms. Wiggins even asked her students whether they wanted to continue, all but one said that they did. In another case, Ms. Groves, um, an eighth grade science teacher here, she also implemented a mindfulness meditation practice with her students um, in the middle school. Um, their responses were a little different from those of the upper school students, because they were really on polar extremes. Some of them really enjoyed it, and even claimed to have um, done it before getting nervous for a sports game or when f um, studying for a test. And then on the other end of the spectrum, some students said that they would have rather had it as a study hall. Um, and we don't know exactly the reasoning behind the difference in responses. We hypothesized that it might have been a result of a difference in the manner in which the idea was introduced a certain difference um, in the educational mindfulness in the middle school as opposed to the upper school because we've seen Dr. Strada come um, to assemblies throughout the year to kind of discuss the idea of mindfulness and offer a basic education. Um, or it might just simply be the age difference between middle schoolers and upper schoolers. Um, overall, we're not too sure. But the science behind mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, the American Psychological Association associates it with um, resulting in reduced rumination, stress reduction, boost to working memory, focus, relationship satisfaction, and less emotional reactivity. Um, but how do these um, kind of med medically abstract concepts apply to a student? Um, looking at it, it can help a student focus um, when studying for a test, it can make them feel less nervous but, or performance or sports game. Looking more at anecdotal data, um, Dr. Estrada read an article which entailed his mindfulness practice that he conducted for five minutes at the beginning of each of his class periods back when he was in Saudi Arabia. And there is evidence of students um, stating that their, their scores went up after engaging in the practice. Whenever they would feel nervous or they couldn't focus, they would engage in the practice and focus on their breath for a few minutes. So, let's try it real quick. I'd like to invite you to mindfulness practice, just so you can see what it can be like. Sit in an upright position, put your hands in your lap or wherever feels comfortable, close your eyes, and just breathe normally. Simply keep your attention on the sensations of the air. Focus on your breath. Don't aim to eliminate thoughts, but acknowledge them. Let them dissipate. Now gently bring your attention back. You can open your eyes. That was my first time leading a mindfulness. <laughs> so I hope it went well. Thank you for engaging in it. But furthermore, um, on the other hand, we looked at gratitude at Cooper. And um, one of the other books that I read, Positive Psychology in a Nutshell, The Signs of Happiness, kind of entailed this idea of three good things. Um, it's basically the idea of going home every day for a week and writing down three things that you're thankful for in a journal or something of that sort. So, um, in that it cultivates a positive mindset and it just um, enables you to kind of focus on those things that you can be appreciative for and those good things in your life rather than the not so good things. And I've actually engaged in that practice and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Ms. Mathis actually ran a study very similar to this with one of her, um, I think it was all of her classes or advisory period. And I discussed it with her and she said that some of the students took it very seriously saying that they um, were thankful that they had good friends they could confide in when having issues. Um, all the way to kids who were just thankful for french fries at McDonald's. <laughs> and so really the practice is what you do with it, but there has been long um, term 
scientific studies to show that it is beneficial in cultivating a more positive, grateful um, mindset. And so I challenge you to engage in that as well. But the difficulties and limitations of this study, one of them was the anecdotal data that I talked about earlier. Um, naturally, due to the circumstances, I wasn't able to run brain scans or do anything um, very long term. But the anecdotal data was still very valuable and that we were able to glean student perspectives and see what they thought about the mindfulness meditation and in what ways it could be improved, in what ways the school could offer um, heightened accessibility when it comes to mindfulness meditation. And then furthermore, the stigma that revolves around the word mindfulness itself. And I'll just kind of talk about that a little bit later, how to address that and how to combat that stigma. But what about me? How has this study affected me? How has it affected the way that I deal with my emotions, my thoughts, and ultimately my behaviors? Um, first off, going back to the power of now, as I talked about earlier, it's helped me in dealing with my emotions. I've been able to distinguish between my life and my life situation. Whenever I've written like an English paper and it gets critiqued, or if someone insults a piece of clothing or something, I don't get too offended because I'm able to separate those things from my true inner being. And I'm able to separate and distance myself from those emotions so that I have more emotional control and more emotional stability. In regards to gratitude journaling, um, I would go home and write down five things that I was, I was thankful for every day. And even on days that weren't so good, it was the last thing that I would think about before I went to bed. I would have. Um, I'd be gracious for those things that were good in my life rather than those things that weren't. And then in regards to meditation, I downloaded an app called Headspace and it actually proved to be quite helpful. It offers a multitude of different types of meditation. You can um, engage in a mindfulness practice before an interview if you're nervous or even before getting on a plane if you're anxious and really um, they vary in length anywhere from five minutes to several hours. And that proved to be immensely helpful in me um, controlling my emotions and um, feeling better. So looking ahead, how can we apply these ideals in the Cooper community to make students' lives better? Um, first off, changing the terminology of mindfulness. Um, in several academic environments, they've changed it to tranquility or calmness is those terms have less of that stigma associated with them because mindfulness has um, certain associations with it that are a result of a certain lacks of education or non-exposure to what mindfulness meditation really is. A greater focus on emotional intelligence is definitely something that would be positive in the future. Students um, being able to have more control of their emotions, being able to distance themselves a little bit um, from their emotions, but most importantly, understanding their emotions and understanding how to um, deal with them in an effective manner to then improve, um, improve themselves, whether it's inside or outside the classroom. And then installation of applications such as Headspace, as I mentioned earlier. Um, whether it's a sports team or part of a small classroom assignment, I think that would be immensely helpful. And then there are multiple different methods of mindfulness meditation, imagery, um, movement, beholding, where you take something like a raisin and you truly contemplate and appreciate every um, part of the raisin and as you digest it, you do it slowly so that you really are able to understand and appreciate the experience in its entirety. And the most important thing about all these methods of meditation is not only what you're thinking about and how you're dealing with your emotions and thoughts in that moment, but how you're able to then apply that to the rest of your day and to the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Do you mind if we ask you a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone have a question? Okay. Um, so you mentioned that that your dad was very subjective. Mm -hmm. If you were going to continue to study, or if you were going to do it all over again, other than doing great scans, which you couldn't do here, <laughs> did you think of ways that you could possibly try to make it more objective? Um, ways of making it more objective. It would be accessible to you. 
Yeah. That would make it accessible to me. Or one way I could have made it more accurate is I wish my um, sample size was larger. Unfortunately, I was only I only really did it with a few different classes. If I could have done it with different classes at different grade levels and then compare those to each other and then ultimately to those different grades, I think the data would have perhaps been a little bit more accurate. I hope that answered your question. Mr. Paul? Thank you for that. Um, you know, th this is, uh, I know it's at universities, the happiness discussion, mm -hmm. it's, uh, they talk about schools, but I'm also hearing it's in the military, mm -hmm. um, that, that the military is using this as the way. So, uh, did you find some uh, venues in your research through athletics or that, that were surprising to you about the utility or application of being thinking about gratitude and happiness and well one of the things that I discussed with Dr. Estrada and I guess when I think of like the business world I think about it being very cutthroat and all of those things but um, for example at Google it's very much a very prevalent part of the Google environment engaging um, in these type of practices so that you're more efficient um, as a worker, you're more productive, and you just contribute more to your end goal. So I'll say that. So I like this idea of focusing on the moment, sort of being in the moment. Um, what challenges do you see to this idea as, as a Cooper student, or if you think about our student population in general, why is that so difficult? And you know, what, could, what, what could we do about it? Um, well, one of the things that I guess personally I found difficult was going back to that, that idea of uh, social media. I mean, I always found like, because when you're on your telephone in the middle of a conversation or sitting at the dinner table, you're always immersed in another moment. So you're kind of splitting your time between different things. So I would say in more of a at home sense, um, trying to take a step away from your phone. But in regards to the Cooper experience, I would say really, going towards um, mediums such as Headspace, as I talked about, maybe doing it in the classroom or small advisory activities, and just recommending for students to do a five to 10 min minute meditation when they go home, or even easier, the gratitude journal, writing three to five things down. Um, Ms. Mathis has said great things about her practice with that, and I think just simple things like that um, used consistently can really prove to be beneficial. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure you probably saw this with this philosophy as well, but like, you know, there's short-term happiness and there's long-term happiness. Generally, a lot of us are after short-term happiness. We play like a game for an hour and we're happy for that hour and probably for the next 10 minutes, but then after that, we were bored or we're agitated if we have nothing else to do. So through your study of happiness, what have you found ensures long-term happiness and peace? Like what kind of mindset do we need to ensure that we're not constantly just chasing it's a short-term happiness? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I would say is very prevalent like throughout the study and even in my own life that I think about is not placing your happiness in the future. Um, don't um, place your happiness and say, I'll be happy when I get the good test grade or I'll be happy when I get to X college or make these amount of friends because that just doesn't prove to be successful in the long term and that's the whole idea behind um, the book that I talked about, The Power of Now. Um, it's all about placing your happiness in that present moment and oftentimes a lot of those stresses and um, things that contribute to our discontent are actually things associated with our past or our future. But if you look at them in isolation in the present moment, they actually don't seem so bad. So that would be my main thing. Don't invest your happiness and promise yourself that happiness will be in the future. Rather, um, make sure that it happens in the present moment. Ms. Wiggins? I just have a little additional data for you. Oh, yeah. Um, that the G block unanimously, except for the one, wanted to continue with the, the um, mindfulness in the second semester, so we've done it, but they always ask for more time. So we've done up to, I think, 10 or 15 minutes at a time. And then the other classes that we see on the board that G block has it, so they've started to say, well, can we do it? And um, so I've asked them, like, what, you know, are you guys just trying to get out of class? <laughs> <laughs> Why is this so popular? You know, I keep kind of sort of jumping up against that question, and they just say it's just time to be instead of time to do. And we have so little time to be in our lives. And pretty much unanimously, whatever, they're all involved in individually, they all feel that way. So that's just been really interesting. It's taught me a lot as a teacher about what students need more of as well. So sharing that is quite popular. That's 
today. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Ms. Brady. glad to engage in any more discussion with you, but we're going to have John Ritter come up now, and he's going to talk to us about military technology in World War II, so thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Ms. Brady said, uh, my name is John Ritter, and I did my independent study on military technological developments, specifically looking at the American M26 Pershing medium tank and the German ME262 jet fighter as kind of benchmarks of the most advanced vehicles in their fields. Now, before going into the actual nitty gritty of things, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the background. Um, I've been interested in this field since I was a, no older than 10, and it's kind of just snowballed into a, an interest which uh, has taken me to this point. Um, and so when I was given the opportunity to do an independent study, I thought, goodness, I really have to take advantage of this. I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to look at vehicles in greater depth than I really ever had before. Now, the first step, once we had agreed to do this, uh, was figuring out what I was going to read. Um, in my past years, I had read books that maybe weren't of the quite scholarly level, um, but I, I took those as a beginning reference. Uh, I, I heard such authors as John Keegan, um, R.P. Hunnicutt, um, Richard Overy, and so I started compiling a list of names um, that were more well-renowned, more established. And um, with that, I created a list of books which initially covered the course of the war, um, looking at the Western Front, um, the war in Russia, um, and then later I looked at books which looked at specifically um, aerial combat, uh, ground combat, uh, looking at those in particular since I've been looking at these vehicles. Um, now, there were some issues in finding some of these books. Um, in dealing with such a specific field, um, not all of these are available in mass. Um, as Mr. Pretty and Ruddles uh, knows well, one of these series in particular, uh, these four books on the ME262, uh, two of them are near impossible to find. Um, even if you can find a library, uh, the nearest library that actually has a copy of this is the US Air Force Academy. And they're not exactly uh, open to uh, the casual researcher. Um, now, once I started reading and I found the books that I could actually get my hands on, uh, we started encountering some more uh, little hiccups and, and uh, certain things. Um, mainly revolving on the fact that this research, uh, in order to really look at this, you really have to have access to the secondary sources that these authors use. Um, R.P. Hunnicutt, for instance, uh, he was able to go back and look at the documents that um, these vehicles have been tested with. So, you know, these are things that are original testing uh, forums that are now in the Smithsonian, or, you know, technical documents uh, from the Messerschmitt Company, which are now either burned, destroyed, or somewhere floating around Germany. Um, but even with that, I was able to start my research and I was able to understand the process of the war, how it actually uh, was conducted, looking at the battle, looking at the tactics, uh, really forming a basis for what I need to understand before looking at vehicles in particular. Now, the first one was the ME262 uh, Schwabe. You'll have to excuse my terrible German pronunciation. <laughs> so I'll just call it Schwabe. That was what uh, it translates into. Um, now, the first step in looking at this vehicle was looking at its past, what had led up to this. And for that, I looked at Messerschmitt. Um, he started building aircraft, uh, it was William Messerschmitt, um, he started building aircraft during the First World War as a, a lighter builder, uh, in fact. And throughout the 1920s and early 30s, he slowly built up his aircraft, uh, his aircraft company, BFW, into quite a well-known and um, well-established company. And, and as the Nazi party took power in the 1930s, he transitioned from mail aircraft and passenger liners more into sport aircraft, some things that were more maneuverable, a little lighter weight, things more suited for military purposes. Um, and in the mid-1930s, he started creating a series of aircraft, uh, the BF-108 Taufen, uh, which was a light sporting aircraft, uh, the BF-110 Heavy Fighter, uh, and more famously, the BF-109 Single Engine Fighter. This ended up being the Luftwaffe's most produced aircraft of the war, and in fact, the most produced aircraft of any country during the entire war. Uh, it served from the mid-1930s up until after the Second World War in some countries. Um, and this, but this aircraft established Messerschmitt's reputation as a designer of light, nimble, but extremely fast aircraft. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes this got him in trouble. Uh, another aircraft, uh, the ME-210, was also a heavy fighter. Now this airplane was um, a little over uh, He cut the length of the tail and changed the shape of the wings in order to make the airframe lighter and faster, but in doing so, he made it woefully unstable and it was known as a death trap. 
And in fact, the aircraft never recovered. It was never put into actual service, even though the, uh, the Luftwaffe spent millions upon millions of Reichsmarks uh, building and developing the aircraft. Now, at the same time, Messerschmitt had been building up his reputation and partly destroying it, uh, another development had been taking place in the aviation world, and that was the development of the turbojet. Uh, basically, uh, this has been an idea floating around since the early 1920s of an engine not being propelled by propeller, uh, but by thrust created from the engine itself. Now, this hadn't really um, came to any fruition until the mid-1930s when a young German scientist named Hans von Ohan, again, German pronunciation, um, came up with his theoretical idea for the first turbojet. And with the help of a German aircraft manufacturer, Heinkel, he was able to develop his first prototype, which first flew in 1939 uh, in a little airplane called the Heinkel 178. And this brought the entire world into the jet age. Uh, now, as the war developed, two competing theories for how a jet engine work uh, came about. And that was Ohan's original centrifugal flow engine, which was preferred by him uh, and all the Allied powers, and the axial flow engine, uh, which was more complicated uh, more expensive to build, but in reality had a higher uh, power ceiling. It, there were more theoretical ideas for engines that could take it beyond what any uh, idea for a central fuel flow engine could. But in the scheme of the war, um, only Germany preferred the active flow engine, but uh, in reality, after the war, um, the active flow was preferred by just about every country in the entire world. Now, the Yang 262 itself was the, uh, the culmination of these two converging timelines in aviation development. Uh, basically, the Luftwaffe had ordered its first uh, jet fighter uh, around the time the Second World War started, but there was no actual engine for them to use. So Messerschmitt uh, was basically just given rough statistics as far as what the rust would be, what weight would be, and just went from there. His design team built an airframe which was quite advanced at the time, and included features, not all of them would be included on the production model, but features including a pressurized cabin, an ejector seat, uh, and things such as leading edge wing slats, which basically, if you imagine, when an aircraft came to land, they automatically deployed and gave the wings more lift so the aircraft could fly at slower speeds and not require as much land, uh, landing strip. But uh, without a doubt, the most advanced feature beyond the turbojet engines was the semi-swept wing. This was not a concept that was understood at the time in the world of uh, aerodynamics. Um, Messerschmitt's team originally did it, in fact, unintentionally. They were worried about the engine's center of gravity uh, basically shifting the plane so it would kind of lean forward. So they swept the wings to kind of balance it out. But in turn, they created an aircraft that actually had much better high-speed performance and uh, undoubtedly set a trend in the world of aviation. Um, now, unfortunately, there were issues. It wasn't all smooth sailing. The original engines intended for the aircraft were BMW power plants. That BMW, which some of them are in the parking lot, but BMW had actually pioneered uh, a lot of aircraft engines. They, a lot of their engines were powering uh, main Luftwaffe fighters. But they had a significant amount of difficulty developing an engine that would work reliably. Um, so as a result, Messerschmitt started looking at other companies. And he came to Junkers, another well-established uh, aircraft and engine manufacturer. And their design, the 004, proved to be the perfect solution. It was a little bit bigger, a little bit less elegant, but it had the right amount of power and it worked well. And so as a result, the first ME262 took flight, the version 3, and achieved a top speed of 550 kilometers per hour. Now, in relation, uh, the top of a piston engine fighter at the time, the VF109E, um, only had a top speed of 485 uh, kilometers per hour. So, big leap forward. Now, there were some issues still. Uh, the aircraft did not look as it does on the screen. Uh, it did not have the same landing gear system. It was a tail dragger. So if you imagine, instead of having three wheels like that, you had two large wheels up front and then a little tail wheel back to the plane kind of rested backwards. Now this created an issue because when the airplane was taking off, the elevators, the things that let the plane go up and down, pitch up, um, they were covered up by the wings. So in order to get the plane into the air, the test pilot had to basically slam his foot on, uh, feet on the brakes in order to make the plane kind of jostle forward. This was not the ideal solution for a combat aircraft. Um, and so Messerschmitt's design team looked at other solutions. Ideally, the tricycle landing gear system. This was uh, an arrangement that really hadn't taken much uh, traction at the time. It was only used on, uh, mainly on the American Bell P-39 Aerocarba, which in itself was a very weird and strange design. But Messerschmitt still implemented it. Uh, and in fact, this created an aircraft which really worked quite well. And so as Messerschmitt uh, further developed the aircraft, it, it seemed to have a promising future. But it was around this time that things started going wrong. And as with most things that went wrong in World War II, they all start with Hitler. Uh, 
basically, he had a vested interest in this new gender crap that was taking, uh, taking shape. Uh, but unfortunately, he didn't want it as a fighter, as the Luftwaffe had, and Meshwick had originally intended it. He wanted it as a bomber. Now, there's an inherent problem with trying to convert aircraft that was meant for high-speed operations to bombing operations. Mainly, um, the bomb racks had mounted so far forward in the aircraft that when the pilot released the payload, uh, the aircraft had an uh, uncontrollable tendency to pitch backwards uh, and go out of control. Additionally, there was no means to aim the bombs. The only uh, bomb site was the traditional gun site for the cannons. Um, so this created an aircraft which really wasn't well suited. Uh, but Messerschmitt, being kind of the yes man that he was, still uh, told Hitler it could be done. And so the ME-262 entered service in mid-1944 as a bomber, resulting in many crashes such as this uh, of one of the first ME-262s uh, flying over Austria. Basically, they were destroyed. They could not perform the role intended of them, and it was kind of a dismal failure. Additionally, other factors were taking the ME-262 down a dark path. Uh, the 004 engine, which had been great in the pre-production models, had to be simplified in order to make it feasible for mass production. Additionally, the facilities available to produce the engines were not quite up to standard, and so as a result, the, uh, the engines were not quite as well built. Uh, this created an, an, an instance where basically over one-third of ME-262s were either lost or severely damaged due to engine or other simplified system failures. Uh, so the future was not looking too bright for the aircraft. But by the end of the war, Hitler had realized his mistake, um, and he released the aircraft for fighter duties. Um, basically, in the closing months of the war, the 262 was kind of able to put together what shattered remains of its uh, advanced design and able to really show its uh, superiority over allied fighters. Um, for instance, and probably one of the most famous examples, is JD-44. This was a German squadron that basically flew only in the last few weeks of the war, but they consisted of the most elite pilots remaining in the Luftwaffe, along with an ample supply of ME-262s. And basically, they were the last stand, and they showed that this fighter really had been an advanced vehicle. It had been uh, a real important aircraft. <laughs> now, in the post-war era, even though the 262 hadn't really made the greatest showing, um, the Allied nations uh, and victors in general took interest in the aircraft. In fact, they scoured, they, they, they scoured throughout Europe for as many examples of 262s and other German jet technologies they could. And so you see in the early few years in the post-war period uh, a resemblance to certain German aircraft um, in these Allied vehicles. For instance, all first-generation Soviet aircraft actually flew with reverse-engineered Junker 004 engines. And the famous American F-86 Sabre, uh, probably one of the most famous jet fighters of the Korean War, used a wing design, a swept wing design, mind you, that was originally intended for the M262. So even though the aircraft itself didn't have the most uh, reliable or uh, famous career, it set a precedent and helped other aircraft uh, become up to that level of security. Uh, now the second vehicle I looked at, this was the American M26 Pershing. And now with the Pershing, I kind of had to look a little farther back starting with pre-war American tank design. Basically, if you imagine, tanks were in their infancy during the First World War. They were meant to cross trenches, cross no man's land, be very slow but armored barges that basically provided a breakthrough mechanism. And the U.S. didn't really uh, get too much traction with this until very late in the war. Um, and most of their vehicles, in fact, all of their vehicles, were either of British or French origin, uh, mainly French-built M1917 light tanks. These were uh, advanced, but a little slow. And throughout the 1920s, uh, the U.S. started experimenting with their own vehicles based on the, M19, um, the M1917 and other early prototype tanks. Um, and they started experimenting with things such as the Christie T3, which on its own did not see much success, but kind of started to lead America in the right direction. The first real successful vehicle the U.S. had was a little vehicle originally known as the T5, but later standardized the M2 medium. Uh, this vehicle uh, kind of combined what had been with World War I uh, technology with new advancements in the field. and uh, incorporated four Sponson uh, machine guns that was a, a very similar feature to the Mark IV tanks of the First World War, but also included a much more modern and more interesting uh, radial aircraft engine as its main power plant, which at the time was, had more horsepower uh, and was more reliable than any tank engine really used in any other tank. Uh, but the M2 was definitely a stepping stone. Um, the big radial engine needed a drive shaft to go from the back to the front of the tank, 
increasing its overall height profile. And as I said, those spots and machine guns weren't exactly too useful in the ever-changing tides of war. And in fact, as the Second World War started, the Americans realized that they needed new vehicles. Uh, in fact, as the, as the Germans invaded France, the US realized that even their tactics were outdated. Uh, the Germans basically allowed their tanks to roam freely from infantry divisions, utilizing their speed uh, and their firepower to levels that the US and the other allies hadn't realized was even possible. So in a, in a ditch effort, um, the, both England and the US agreed to develop a new vehicle based on the same platform as the M2. This can be known as the M3 Lee. Um, it was basically it was deployed before a prototype was even built, and it used a 75 millimeter gun, the same caliber of gun being used by modern German and Russian tanks, but in the hull. It was in a limited traverse, and it couldn't really um, act flexibly. This was only a stopover, but it proved to be good enough for the time being. But while that vehicle was uh, in service, a new vehicle was taking shape. That was the M4 Sherman. Uh, it originally it originated with the T6 pilot program, but it created a vehicle which now mounted a 75 millimeter gun in a fully rotating turret. This was superior firepower uh, to anything that had been used in the US arsenal before. And it still used the same platform as the M3 and M2. Uh, they basically, they wanted to standardize as many parts as possible. So as a result, that same high profile still existed, uh, and the same basic drive train existed with the radial engine. Now the M4 in service uh, with the British in North Africa had proved to be a very versatile uh, and strong tank. Uh, it was very comparable to uh, the German Panzer IVs that were being used at the time and could pretty easily deal with them. But as the war continued, uh, the US and England didn't really see a need to upgrade the vehicle. They felt as though the firepower would still be applicable even years down the road. Uh, this kind of created a situation where the Germans were able to get ahead. Uh, of the U.S. in tank design. And by the time the invasion of Normandy came about in 1944, the U.S. was still using the same M4 Germans with 75 millimeter guns. There had been prototypes mounted with larger weapons, but the U.S. felt, partly due to the fog of war, and not knowing what the Germans were using, that they needed these larger weapons. Um, and as a result, when the Germans went ashore uh, in the invasion of Normandy, they suffered a 32% loss ratio uh, over all of the vehicles that were being deployed, um, which was quite catastrophic. This was a wake-up call for Allied tank commanders. And so as a result, in a dish effort, the 76 millimeter gun, as you see in these pictures here, was mounted on the Sherman. And this created a more upgraded version of the vehicle, um, but it was still that same platform. It was still, at the end of the day, a 1930s vehicle. Um, and so by the end of the war, um, it was quite outdated. Uh, and, a part of, and, a, and a progress towards a new and different tank uh, was really needed. And in fact, that had started beforehand um, in 1943 with the T-20 series. Uh, this was a series of prototypes that basically um, sought to uh, apply every theory and idea that had been kind of stirring around in the U.S. ordnance industry um, over the past few years and apply them to prototype deals to see what worked and what didn't. Now, the original vehicles were the T-20, T-22, and T-23. And they tested features such as automatic loading mechanisms for main guns, uh, torsion bar suspension, which at the time was a modern and much more stable platform, um, a combined engine and transmission, which reduced the overall height of vehicles uh, and created a, a different uh, crew layout. Also systems such as gas electric drivetrains, which meant the vehicle didn't really need uh, a driver to change gears as often because the, the engine could be left at a constant RPM level. Um, other features included a, a larger main gun and different armor layouts. But at the end of the day, uh, only one of these vehicles really proved to be of any work. That's the T-23. It utilized that gas electric drivetrain and the new 76 millimeter gun. But unfortunately, it was actually rejected by the US Army, even though it showed promise, probably because the Army felt it wasn't enough of an upgrade over the M4. Its armor was the same thickness, and its gun was the same one being theoretically applied to the new Shermans at the time. Uh, additionally, and the biggest problem, um, was the fact that it, it basically messed up the whole logistical chain of the US Army. Uh, you see, every other armored and treaded vehicle at the time used either the M4, M3, M2 platform or the Stuart light tank platform. And so this new vehicle with its crazy transmission and all sorts of other wild parts would basically mess up the system that the US had uh, been able to build over the past few years. Uh, and so the vehicle was rejected. But ultimately, its 76 millimeter gun and turret were applied to those 76 millimeter Shermans. Now, in result of that, um, new vehicles were built, uh, new prototypes, the T-25 and T-26, and these vehicles utilized bigger guns, as the U.S. had realized their mistake in not upgrading uh, tanks with the correct weaponry. 
So as a result, the big 90 millimeter M3, which was converted from an anti-aircraft gun, was applied to these new vehicles. But as additionally, it used the same basic platform as the T23 with that combined engine and transmission, but used a traditional um, Ford V8 engine and normal transmission. Now, initially, these vehicles were rejected by uh, the U.S. Army for the same reasons that it felt as it was needed. But after the battles in late 1944 in Europe, where the Shermans again suffered catastrophic losses in Belgium, uh, the Army felt they needed them. And so as a result, in early 1945, a group of 20 pre-production T26 E3 uh, Pershings was sent to Europe and was known as the Zebra Mission. And this was basically the moment in which they were baptized with fire. Uh, they were able to show that their design was superior to the Germans, but unfortunately, um, the German armor levels had been depleted so much by this time that there were only a few hundred tanks versus thousands of Allied vehicles. And so the few Pershings that were there really weren't able to make much of an impact. Now, in the Korean War, the Pershing was still the main vehicle in the army. Uh, basically, in the immediate uh, years after the war ended, there was stagnation in tank design. And so the US uh, continued to use the F-26. But in Korea, it was finally able to show that superiority that it had been designed with. Uh, basically, the North Koreans were using Soviet-built T-34-85 medium tanks. And this was a vehicle that was only a few months older than the Pershing. But it was able to basically dominate. Uh, there are instances of two or three Pershings facing off against over five T-34s and coming out on top with none of them uh, bearing any damage. And basically, at the moment more, the Pershing was now old. Uh, the, the Korean War, there were new vehicles coming at the very end, such as the F-46 Patton, which were based off, of, uh, based off the F-26 in basic form, but were upgraded. Um, now, in conclusion, uh, I look at these two vehicles and I, I see uh, vehicles that in their own right weren't able to really make the impact they needed, uh, whether it be through bureaucratic failure, um, simple conditions of war, you know, Germany, they were losing resources towards the uh, ending a few months, and so they didn't have those high stress materials they needed to build those engines. Um, the M26 wasn't seen as needed. Uh, these are problems that you simply can't count for unless you know what's going to happen in war. And commanders didn't quite know. You know, there's a fog of war. Uh, but in reality, even though these two vehicles did not have the direct impact they needed, they still proved to be such a precedent for future vehicles. Um, the M26 Pershing proved to be um, a platform for basically all Western post-war vehicles, such as the Leopard 1, AMX 30, and even most American designs. And that's really the point I wanted to make. Uh, you know, even a vehicle does not have to be successful. Uh, Weapons development does not always produce a vehicle which is combat successful, but in technological superiority, these vehicles really were the cream of the crop. So thank you. William. So for some people who may not be as familiar with this topic as you are, what is the advantage of having a jet fighter? What advantage does that give you over your so the, the intended, the intended uh, security was that these aircraft would have such high, higher speeds than Allied fighters that they'd be able to swoop in and attack enemy bomber formations and then quickly um, break off of those formations without really suffering as much damage. Uh, basically a speed uh, advantage. Gabe. Okay. Um, so I don't have any more questions because I'm just a little very stupid. I tried to have some more But um, I have a more personal question. <laughs> So, you know, this project began like last semester, you know, but arguably the project began when I wrote this article, we were passionate about the subject. So, when does this project begin to go on? Well, I, the M26 has been a favorite tank of mine for years. And so, basically, I've been interested in it for many, many years beforehand. But I really wanted to uh, look at this project in terms of solidifying the knowledge I had on it. So, you could take this all the way back to middle school. Uh, as far as when it started, it's, it's really been a, a long-term love. Mr. Libby. Do tanks make you happy? Tanks make you happy. Rob. So some of these concepts that you explained um, as to why some of these people are successful, are many of them still used today, or have they been learned about? Yes. Uh, in fact, the, the basic layout of the combined transmission engine uh, is still something seen on most uh, tanks today. Uh, even if you look at a vehicle such as the M1 Abrams, um, it has a jet engine instead of a uh, piston engine, but that basic drivetrain and crew layout uh, from the M26 still carries over. 
and, and even in the air, uh, the axial flow turbojet um, proved to be a design which basically was carried through post-war, or even on civilian airliners. Uh, if you look at a 737 from the 1960s, they had an engine of fairly similar design. Thank you. Thank you. So, my NSP this year has been uh, creating, uh, as many of you may know, uh, a student online student news publication uh, called The Dragon Tales. Uh, and so, in order to understand how this paper has really come to fruition, I think there's three questions that we really need to be asking. Uh, number one is, why? Like, why do we need a paper in the first place? You know, uh, we have other publications. Um, what makes this particular publication different? Number two is how was I going to establish uh, this publication, and uh, what was the process I was going to do? Uh, was it going to take a year, or uh, and what? Who would, who would I be working with in establishing this paper? And number three was what was I doing? Oh yeah, I was creating a student newspaper, <laughs> uh, but not just any student newspaper, but the first student newspaper of the John Cooper School. So initially, I decided that I needed to establish an overall objective. Um, and that was basically so that I could establish the why for myself. So how I actually came out with the idea was uh, the summer before my 10th uh, grade year, I was just uh, thinking, uh, as you do, and um, I realized that uh, one of the problems that we had was that uh, the students, uh, us as students, and our faculty had a very different idea of you know, what was going on. And we were unaware of some of the school events and the issues on campus, and therefore unaware to discuss our opinions and develop solutions. Um, and so I realized that in the end what we were missing was an active voice. While we had voices through other publications, we didn't have an active voice coming directly from the student body. And so I decided that the student newspaper would be the best uh, uh, option in bringing about real discussion between us and faculty, and therefore developing a better bond. And uh, so, with that in mind, I uh, realized that I needed to establish a, uh, a reasoning for why I was pursuing uh, the paper and how I would go about the process. So I decided to produce that my goal would be produ to produce a long-lasting student newspaper that provides a forum for discussion to the student body and strengthens the bond between students and faculty. So with that goal in mind, kind of like a guiding compass of some sorts, I uh, met with Mr. Pop and Ms. Crane, and initially uh, I spoke with Ms. Crane, and we developed um, sort of kind of like a baseline, a basic idea of what a student newspaper would look like. And uh, she actually came up with the name, so uh, credit there. And um, but yeah, and so with uh, some convincing, they realized that this would be an excellent idea. And um, so they helped really, honestly, to set me up for success. And uh, for that, thank you. Um, and so they decided that uh, the best option for me would be to take a year as an independent study. And as you can tell, it's worked out pretty well. Um, but the main lesson I learned from that was that if you have an idea, even if you're not sure how it may turn out, it's a good idea to give it a try. And um, so from there, uh, we decided obviously to do an ISB. And so this year, what I have been working on, uh, mainly four things. Uh, the first one is meeting. So, lots of meetings. Um, the biggest lesson maybe I've learned about my ISP has been planning ahead. Um, you need to, especially for meetings, uh, people have a bunch of different things going on, uh, and so the best option is to leave lots of time for everything to go wrong, and you'll have enough time. Um, <laughs> but uh, initially, so um, some of my first meetings, uh, along with Mr. Pop, were, who is my sponsor, um, were meeting with Advancement back in September, and they gave me insight on how uh, they promote um, and uh, how actually they run in a more professional setting. And they also agreed to grant us the use of the uh, social media pages, which we can use for our publication. I then set up a meeting with Miss Fees, and um, she gave me guidance on the reporting aspect of uh, a publication. And um, from there, I agreed to actually um, cover the signature author series. And then I also uh, spoke at a faculty meeting, and the main purpose of that was to uh, grant permission for taking pictures uh, in class, during uh, class activities, for the publication. But the majority of my meetings this year have been with Mr. Pop, my sponsor, 
and we've basically been discussing my work and um, deciding on how we can help to best represent our school community. We looked at what we value most and seeing how to best reflect that. And recently, we've just added three new faculty sponsors who will actually be in charge of uh, the uh, final, they'll kind of be like the final line of approval for the actual publication next year. And that is Ms. Ham Connard, uh, Mr. Lowry, and uh, Mrs. Rice. And um, so, apart from meeting, uh, I did a lot of researching. And um, so I did a lot of extensive research on other school newspapers, and that's college and high school newspapers, as well as some professional papers to see how they differ. And so some examples of those are just like the Chicago Maroon, the Sanford Daily, the Black and White, and uh, professional newspapers. So I was looking at how the papers are actually run and what they did good and what they did that I, we didn't like so much. And so like for example, uh, one of the good things that I learned, especially because we're doing an online publication, uh, one of the best things I learned was that uh, clickbait is actually very useful. Um, we've all been there where we click on something and then we end up clicking on a bunch of other stuff and eventually we spend an hour looking at why bunnies are fluffy. And um, that's, it, but, it, but it works. And so if we're uh, using an online publication and our goal is to inform students, we want them to learn as much as possible. And so when you click on one article, we want it to be aesthetically designed and also uh, the headlines and everything to be eye-catching so that you want to click on another thing and eventually you've learned everything. One thing I've learned that's not so good is that some, uh, this is especially a problem with the professional papers actually, but um, one of the problems is that there's no separation between the news aspects of the paper and the opinion aspects of the paper. So sometimes what happens is um, you achieve bias through that um, because um, if you start blending the opinion piece, pieces and the news pieces, then people don't know which is which. And so what, one of the things we want to do with our paper is to keep the news pieces purely factual and have the opinion pieces be as opinionated as they are. Um, and from that respect, uh, I've learned uh, many other things like that, but those are just some examples. Among that, I've been doing some writing. So uh, I conducted a few interviews, and I wrote some of my own articles, uh, most notably the Signature Author Series article, which I covered back in December. And um, originally, I found uh, interviewing to be a little bit challenging because, you know, it's kind of weird to just walk up to someone and be like, hey, how do you like the lockers? And they're like, <laughs> I like lockers. And so, um, so uh, actually when I met with uh, Ms. Spies, she gave me a few tips on that. And one of that is just, you know, kind of being yourself when you do an interview. And um, also not to worry about interviewing uh, people around the, the same people, you know. Uh, um, and then I also learned that news writing is completely different from English essay writing or historical writing. And that's mainly because uh, it just has a different style. So with news writing, you mainly want to have like, the first paragraph is pretty much the lead. And uh, that basically has the majority of the like quick information that you can grab. And then what you're uh, intending to do is if that first lead can capture the reader's attention, then you increase in detail as you go, but also maintain the reader's attention uh, all the while. And um, for that reason, we decided that while news writing is a little bit complicated, we decided that it would be a good option to have a workshop um, once we organize our staff um, to, uh, before uh, our first publications. And uh, we can sort of teach them uh, all that I've learned this year and um, so that we ensure that everybody's on the same page uh, with regards to news writing and uh, other writing. The last thing I've been doing is building. So uh, actually all of these kind of feed into the aspect of building the paper. but. Um, so we've done a lot of things this year, but uh, a lot of it has been building a structure for the paper. So uh, with that respect, we've established an uh, ideal number of staff, so that's about 25-ish, uh, and um, that's with five editors. Uh, we've established some staff positions, so we've got eight main staff positions and then about uh, five editors. So uh, we have a columnist, who uh, columnists basically write an article in each edition, and uh, it's about a specific topic. So uh, say, uh, John's interested in uh, World War II tanks and uh, planes. Then he can write uh, an article about that on uh, every uh, edition, and it can be different every time so that people who are interested in the same things
can uh, glean uh, current information about that. Then we've got uh, sports writers, obviously pretty, pretty straightforward. You pretty much go attend the sports events and write articles about them. Uh, we're amazing at sports. And uh, we've got featured writers. Uh, those pretty much cover the special events. And so um, things like uh, our pep rallies or uh, prom, you know, and um, then we've got uh, our basic reporters and they cover pretty much all the events and uh, write articles about them. They'll be accompanied by the photographers uh, who will attend um, all the events as well, making sure we can get our original pictures. Um, and then we've got our website designers. So for the website, we're planning on developing a base website and having the website designers tweak it uh, to be aesthetically pleasing and also efficient in uh, uh, contributing to what the paper is designed to be. But the main distinction that I want to make with the website designers is they'll be focusing on pretty much the, uh, solely the technical aspect of design. Um, because we have another position for uh, the other design. Uh, then we've got uh, promotion managers, and uh, the promotion manager is actually quite important because um, one of the things uh, that we need to do if we want to keep students informed is to make sure that they know about the paper so that they can uh, get information from it. And then, of course, we've got our all-time favorite the social media correspondent, um, and um, they will be also working with the promotion manager to make sure that uh, everybody is informed and um, one thing with the social media, though, is we do need to be a little bit careful on what we're posting. So we will not be constantly updating it um, throughout the day, but uh, we will be, uh, they'll go through the same uh, process as uh, any other article. Um, then as for the editors, we've got uh, the editor-in-chief, of course, and then um, below, the editor-in-chief who just kind of manages uh, all the editors and the staff members is uh, the copy editor. The copy editor works as kind of like an assistant to the uh, editor-in-chief. Uh, the copy editor uh, makes sure to correct all the grammar, syntax, and all that from the editors. And they also work on um, helping out some of the content. So they'll help the staff members organize uh, their content so that's more effective. So like the news writing aspect that I was talking about with the lead and then uh, expanding on detail, they'll help with that. And they'll also help with uh, choosing the topics. Um, after that, we've got the chief photographer, and they'll just kind of be the head of the photography team. Um, they'll be required to attend more of the events. And then we've got feature editors, obviously in charge of the feature writers, news editors, sports editors, and the director of design. And the director of design will be in charge of not, they'll be in charge of the website designers. So they'll basically be telling the website designers what to do. And, but they'll also be in charge of the other aspects of design. So when we're promoting something, how can we make it more aesthetically appealing so that people want to pick it up or look on it? Um, and then uh, from there, we uh, establish the requirements for our staff members. Um, and we develop student contracts so that um, our staff members would be held accountable even when they're not on assignment. Then we establish uh, kind of an idea is a student portfolio uh, basically, which keeps um, the student work in one location so that uh, we're making sure that everybody's contributing as they should be. And then a staff manual. So one of the things uh, that's really important is establishing a long-lasting paper. Because I'm only going to be here for next year, but what about the editors after me? They need to have the same kind of uh, idea about what the paper is about as me. And so uh, staff manual will pretty much compile all the work I've done and all the work of the editors after me into one location so that uh, at any time um, you can access the staff manual and staff members can get an idea of which direction they're supposed to take. And we'll also kind of streamline the process. So instead of having to ask uh, their editor every time, that takes time. And sometimes people will have other things to do. So you can always refer to the staff manual. Then we establish a publishing cycle. So the publishing cycle will be about a month and we're planning on having six editions yearly. Um, and then we started developing a website. And so primarily we're working on a base structure for that. But all these things really just help to establish a foundation for what the paper is going to look like. And so uh, a few weeks ago, I announced that we were ready to begin recruiting members. And so uh, just this Monday, we re released the applications and they'll be due on the 18th. And actually, our sponsors did help out with that. Uh, they helped to uh, sort of guide me on what to include in the application and also uh, 
how the application would actually be structured itself. And uh, I think that a guide is something that's really important, and that's why we developed our mission statement. Um, our mission statement has gone through uh, a series of edits uh, to streamline it and to make it more a, a best, the best representation representation of the paper as, uh, as I said, it wants to be a long-term thing. And for that matter, the mission statement is the best guide. So uh, when designing anything as we do with the school mission statement, uh, when making decisions based on uh, unschool administration, we look at the school mission statement. And so for the same way, I think we should look at the um, uh, newspaper mission statement when making decisions for the newspaper. So uh, our mission statement as of now is the Dragon Tales is an objective, objective student-led publication of the John Cooper School. The paper's mission is to inform readers in the Cooper community of student events and issues in order to foster civil discourse among our diverse group of select students, enabling them to become effective communicators, responsible citizens, and confident leaders. Now you may be thinking, gee, it sounds a lot like our school mission. <laughs> 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 Now, um, the school mission is a guide, and we want our uh, mission uh, statement of the paper to represent that. Because, after all, it is the Dragon Tales school newspaper of the John Cooper School. So, um, as you can see, there's two paths in this picture. And uh, as it's going to be long lasting, we want it to be very clear which way is the right path and which way is the wrong path. So, um, it's designed to be a guide. And uh, as undoubtedly it will undergo some tweaking in the future, I think uh, I include the mission statement in all of our documents, and I think uh, it's a very important part of what the newspaper has become. So where to now? Well, I mean, we just released applications, so, um, and we're actually already beginning to get some back. So um, as of the 18th, we will have all the applications in, and we will, we as in me and Mr. Pop and our sponsors, will begin sorting through the applicants and seeing which ones best fit the mission statement. And from there, we'll select the best candidates, and from those candidates, we will then um, have them come in for interviews and uh, to in order to uh, select the editors. And um, from those editors, then we will uh, work over the summer and um, have the workshop just before school starts. And then next year, we will publish our first ever uh, CD newspaper of the John Cooper School. So, uh, from my point of view, what have I really learned? Well, I've learned, and I like to stick to uh, three things, because you best remember the threes, but um, I, I've learned really three things about this process. And that's, if you want to do an ISP or any other venture in life, really, you need to, uh, number one, investigate or identify a problem or uh, something that you want to know more about. And number two, investigate the root of that problem or the root of the question. Find out some more information about it. Um, and number three, implement a long-term solution or develop a theory about that question that you can use and apply in your life. Thank you. So we can actually have like a section, if, if there are enough uh, alums interested in that, then yeah, we could have a section in the paper that could be like uh, alums advice or something. And um, you know, we could have it, because it's online, it's, it's subject to change, it's not like the format is uh, stuck to one uh, location. So yes, I'll take that into consideration. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so I'm kind of still my question. <laughs> but, um, so I have another question. <laughs> if it was somewhere along the lines of how will the newspaper stay objective, um, I mean, you have the factual part of it, and you have the opinions part of it, and that's not, about, and that's not supposed to be objective, but my question, I guess, is, um, is it, since it's a student newspaper, is it also kind of the role of the newspaper to reflect diverse ideological ranges in the school? So, like, we'll have multiple voices. Yeah, so actually, uh, seeing that point, uh, that's a really good point, um, but the main thing you can do 
do when you're having opinion pieces and you're trying to be objective is to have both sides of the opinion. So if you have an opinion on one side of the aisle, you want to have another opinion piece on the other side of the aisle. And therefore they counter, you want to have, you don't want to have one that's really high level writing and the other one that's not. You want to maintain a standard so that uh, it's a balanced paper. And uh, that also stays true for um, what content you produce because um, I know a lot of professional newspapers, they, uh, a lot of the bias comes from uh, what they select and uh, who they select to write those articles. And so if you decide to only cover certain things, then you end up with bias. So what we'll do is when we look at uh, what we're covering, we'll look at a holistic approach. And um, so yes, we will try to uh, incorporate a, div a div diverse range of articles so that uh, everybody is included. Great work, great presentation, well done. Um, this is just kind of a technical, are you, are you planning to have a style book in terms of are you going to use associated with that style? It's just a really great guideline. Be whatever you choose to use, but when you're in the thick of putting something out and you have something to go to on capitalization, are you, are you working that into your Yeah, system? so um, that actually will probably be included as part of the staff manual because you know the staff manual wants to be like the main referral. Um, as for an actual uh, the actual guide that we will be, be using, I know we have a Cooper guide, but there are also um, guides that are specifically made for newspapers. So um, yeah, we'll probably we haven't actually established one, but uh, we'll probably we'll look into that and um, make sure that we establish one. Yeah, Associated Press. Okay, yeah. Great. Thank you so much.